My friend, and welcome to the 128th episode of the listener supported Congressional Dish. I'm your host, Jennifer Briney. If this is your first time listening to Congressional Dish, this is a podcast that I invented three and a half years ago. And basically, the whole goal of it, the whole aim is just to understand what's going on in Congress and to get more attention paid to what's going on in Congress. And the reason is that our power as regular people, as regular citizens in the United States, rests in Congress as opposed to the executive branch. And one of the frustrations of my life is turning on the television or going on the Internet and any time in this country that you seem to hear people talking about politics or writing about politics. They're writing about the executive branch, especially during this 2016 election year. If you're talking about politics, you're probably talking about Hillary and Trump. Well, there's so much more going on in our government that affects you so much more directly than this campaign for that one branch, the one executive branch. Right now, your Congress, you know, the entire House of Representatives is up for election right now. That's 435 representatives that we can fire immediately. And then there's a third of the Senate that's up for election in a couple of months. And we need to know what they're doing in Congress so that we can judge their job performance and decide whether or not these people deserve to keep their jobs. And so that's the goal of Congressional Dish. I'm just trying to yank as much attention as I can away from the executive branch and put it on Congress and try and do it in a way that doesn't put you to sleep. Today's episode is going to be about an issue that is not being covered nearly enough, and that is Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is a U.S. territory, and I know that for me, before doing this episode, I had no idea what that meant. Puerto Rico is just one of those places that I don't think about ever at all. I mean, before doing this episode, I couldn't tell you where it was on a map. I mean, I knew it was in the Caribbean somewhere, but I couldn't tell you which island it was. And I certainly didn't know that everybody in Puerto Rico is a U.S. citizen. (laughs) Didn't know that. It just exposed my own ignorance towards this island that is, you know, the people that live there are just as American as I am. And yet they're not treated the same way. And so what's happening right now is that Puerto Rico is in some huge, huge financial trouble. And for reasons that will become clear as this episode progresses, our Congress is just about the only governmental body that can do anything about it at this point. And so the House of Representatives has passed a bill that the Senate is going to vote on. I mean, the Senate has announced that they want to vote on this before July 1st, and it doesn't look like amendments are going to be allowed, which means that the bill that I read for this episode is most likely going to be the one that becomes law. And if anything changes, of course, I will update that in the next episode. But right now, this is looking like it. And so I think it's important for us to know what we as a collective American society are going to do for or more accurately to Puerto Rico. But before I can get into the details of the bill that's moving through Congress, we need to acknowledge that I think very few of us in this country know anything about Puerto Rico. I, I'm no better. I knew nothing about Puerto Rico before doing this this episode. And so Puerto Rico, for those of you who don't know, is an island in the Caribbean. If you were to go from you know west to east, it goes Cuba, Haiti, Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico. So it's on the Dominican Republic side of that island. In 1898, Puerto Rico was a colony of the Spanish, and we invaded and took it over. So it wasn't quite regime change. It's not like Puerto Rico was independent and we just said, you're ours now. We really more stole it from the Spanish. And after we took it over, Puerto Rico didn't become a state. It's still not a state. It's a territory. And that means that Puerto Rico has unique rules. It's it's different from the states. Article 4, Section 3 of the Constitution gives Congress, the U.S. Federal Congress, the power to make all of the rules and regulations for the territory. So even though it's not a state, it's still beholden to the rules that are made by the dingbats that we are electing to Congress. And so 20 years or so after the invasion, in 1917, the people of Puerto Rico were granted U.S. citizenship. 
but they weren't granted all of the same rights that I have. So, for instance, they have no real representation in the federal government. In Congress, they do have a representative, but that representative isn't allowed to vote. And the people themselves of Puerto Rico aren't allowed to vote. Now, this might be confusing because, you know, the night that Hillary Clinton was prematurely declared the nominee of the Democratic Party, because, by the way, she still doesn't have all the delegates she needs. She's still not technically the Democratic nominee. It's not official. But the night before the California primary, because of Puerto Rico's votes, the Associated Press said, oh, she has all she needs when you add that to the superdelegates that haven't voted yet. And that's how they were able to declare her the nominee way earlier than they they should have. And that might be confusing because when I say that Puerto Rico doesn't get to vote, well, they do get to vote in the primaries depending on which party they're voting for. So it's up to the parties whether or not they allow Puerto Rico to vote. But the big vote, you know, like the one in, in November where they pick the president, Puerto Rico won't be involved. They don't get to vote for that. And then in Congress, which, you know, like I said, makes their rules and regulations, they don't get a say in Congress either. It's it's really quite unfair. And John Oliver, one of the most brilliant people in the universe, on his show last week tonight, he did an episode on the territories and explained why the territories can't vote. Where did that unfairness come from? More than 4 million people live in the U.S. territories. More than 98% of them are racial or ethnic minorities. And the more you look into the history of why their voting rights are restricted, the harder it is to justify. Because it goes all the way back to when America first acquired them. The United States flag is flying over these lands. And so some people said, well, doesn't that mean American laws apply? In 1901, the insular cases. Basically, the judgment of the Supreme Court was that the new territories were inhabited by, quote, alien races. And they may not be able to understand Anglo-Saxon laws. Therefore, the Constitution doesn't have to apply. So, yeah, the reason that the, you know, brown people in the territories aren't allowed to vote really just harkens back to good old American racism. And so, you know, as far as fairness is concerned, it's incredibly unfair. And so that's what we're dealing with here is Puerto Rico needs Congress's help. And it's a body that they have no representation in. So it's a tricky situation. Now, the reason that Puerto Rico, one of our territories, has come to the U.S. Congress and said, hey, I need your help, was explained so much better by John Oliver than I ever could explain to you. And so John Oliver and I here are going to team up to explain what the situation is in Puerto Rico. But I have to tell you that he did an entire episode on this Puerto Rico situation. It's worth watching. I've linked to it for you in the show notes. And if you want to look it up on HBO yourself, it was the April 17th, 2016 episode. Go and watch it because I've cut out all the jokes. So um, all the good stuff is on HBO. But anyway, here's John Oliver explaining what the problem is in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is currently around $70 billion in debt and it is wreaking havoc on the island. The poverty rate is a staggering 45%. And last year alone, over 80,000 people left for the mainland U.S. Puerto Rico has already shut down more than 150 schools in the last few years. The cash-strapped government has dramatically hiked sales taxes from 7% to 11.5%, far higher than any in the United States. Yes, right now, Puerto Rico is like the last tower records. Everything's overpriced, everyone's being laid off, and there's still a weirdly large number of Ricky Martin CDs. Okay, so I didn't cut out all the jokes. But anyway, the situation in Puerto Rico is really bad. I mean, $70 billion in debt and all of those services being cut and the taxes on the people being raised. I mean, it's a serious situation and that's not all. The governor of Puerto Rico actually testified to the Senate about six months ago telling them what else the government has done to try and deal with this debt. And before I play you the clip, I just want to tell you a little side note about this hearing. This hearing took place in the Senate Judiciary Committee on December 1st of 2015. This hearing wasn't aired on on C-SPAN. And what I found really bizarre about it is that they had two people representing Puerto Rico. They had the governor of Puerto Rico who came to Congress basically to beg for them to do something. And then they also had the representative for Puerto Rico, you know, that guy that can't vote in the House of Representatives. That guy came over to the Senate and testified too. His name was uh, Pedro Perlusi. But you have these two people who are representing Puerto Rico and they weren't 
allowed to be asked any questions. So they came before Congress. They were allowed to give five minute statements and then they were told to piss off. And then some panel full of, you know, random smart people and came and testified about, you know, how the hedge funds feel about this. And they were asked all the questions. It was really, really strange. But during his, you know, five minute statement, all he was allowed to give, this is what Governor Padilla told Congress about what the government of Puerto Rico is trying to do to deal with their debt. Over the last decade, Puerto Rico has endured significant austerity measures. My administration has cut expenditures by over 20% of the budget. We reformed our largest pension fund from a defined benefits to defined contribution, including current employees. New tax on transferring pricing was put in place, and most importantly, Puerto Rico is currently transitioning from the sales tax to a value-added tax with an 11.5% rate. My administration has approved new revenue measures that impacted gasoline and water, water rate, dramatically reducing government expenditures and froze collective bargainings. Public transportation routes have been cut and we have been consolidating schools to improve education outcomes and force cost savings. The reduction in the government payroll has also been dramatic. 27% over the last seven years which is affecting already essential services. And massive outmigration is shrinking our tax base, throwing us in the debt spiral. These austerity measures are in addition to the sales tax implemented in 2007, along with increase in tolls and water rates under previous administration. Property tax rates were double, a new 4% excise tax on the export from foreign and U.S. corporations with manufacturing operation in Puerto Rico was, was legislated, and more than 30,000 public employees were laid off. We have taken significant austerity measures, and we will take additional if it's necessary, but the magnitude of the fiscal and economic problem bearing down on Puerto Rico is simply too large. Imagine what it must be like to be the citizens of Puerto Rico. I mean, everything has gotten more expensive. If you just listen to what he said about the taxes, there's more property taxes and the value added tax, 11.5%. That's super high on top of 11% sales tax. They added a gas tax. There's more tolls on their roads. They have higher water rates. Everything's more expensive. Well, at the same time, the people there are bringing in less money. I mean, first of all, 30,000 people got completely laid off. So they have no income whatsoever, which will cause more services to be needed because those people still need health care, still need food, all the things that they would have been buying with their paychecks they're no longer getting. And then for the people that are retired, he just said that they've already done pension cuts. So people that, you know, aren't earning anything because they're too old, they were expecting to have a certain amount of money coming in every month and now they don't. And then on top of that, there's the cuts in services. I mean, consolidated schools. When you consolidate a school, the school that gets eliminated, well, those people no longer have a job. And then I watched this thing. It wasn't good for a sound clip. I don't have a clip for you, but I watched this thing where it was a bunch of mothers talking about how now they have to drive their kids an hour and a half each way to go to the new school because their local schools were closed. That's crazy. And then on top of that, they cut public transportation. So now these people also have to drive. They they have less routes to get them where they need to go. I mean, to be a citizen of Puerto Rico, that sounds like it sucks. No wonder so many people are leaving. And so we've diagnosed the problem. We know that life in Puerto Rico sucks because they ran out of money. But the question becomes, how did they run out of money? And it turns out that when you look at what did it, so much of it traces back to Congress and the dumb laws and decisions that were made by Congress. Here's John Oliver from his April 17th episode of Last Week Tonight. Because it's a territory, many laws that apply to the states have loopholes concerning Puerto Rico. And as you will see time and time again in this piece, those little legal quirks have had massive consequences. Some good, but many utterly devastating. And let's start with a quirk many Puerto Ricans liked, something called Section 936. It gave tax breaks to encourage businesses that would otherwise have moved overseas to move to Puerto Rico. And it worked. In the 1970s, the U.S. government helped attract business to Puerto Rico by granting generous tax breaks. That led to a booming manufacturing sector, 
particularly pharmaceutical companies. At its peak, the island was home to 89 drug manufacturing plants. So Section 936 allowed businesses to dodge all federal taxes on money earned in Puerto Rico. And not having to pay those taxes saved the businesses a lot of money, which is why the multinational drug manufacturers moved there. Now, the idea behind this wasn't really designed to, like, help Puerto Rico. That was kind of just a byproduct. The idea came out of the Cold War because this all happened in 1976. And the idea was to use this tax dodging program to build Puerto Rico as a free market alternative to Cuba, which was, you know, the neighbor two islands down. And I've learned time and time and time and time again in my time researching bills for Congressional Dish that free market is generally code for freeing businesses from laws so that they can keep as much in profit as possible. And it turned out that this, you know, free market sweet deal did benefit Puerto Rico. Not only did Puerto Rican residents get hired by the tax dodging companies who moved there, but the Puerto Rican government earned money on this arrangement because Puerto Rico got 10 percent of the now inflated profits that the companies were sending home from the mainland. And so as far as free market experiments were concerned, you know, this one cost the U.S. federal government a lot in missing taxes. But it worked out pretty well for Puerto Rico. At the time, things were good. But then came a decision by Congress and the Clinton administration in 1996. Unfortunately for Puerto Rico, Congress got rid of those tax breaks to offset a tax cut on the mainland, phasing them out completely by 2006. And between that and the U.S. recession, Puerto Rico lost over half its manufacturing jobs, putting its economy into a flaccid state that no amount of Viagra could fix. And this policy change was cited by Governor Padilla of Puerto Rico himself as one of the major contributors for the debt problems that Puerto Rico is dealing with today. The loss of Section 936 benefits significantly contributed to the crippling of our economy and led directly to the recession that began in 2006. And so now, with the tax dodging scheme no longer available to the multinationals, the multinationals had gotten out of Puerto Rico, a lot of people got laid off, the 10% that Puerto Rico was getting from the multinationals' profits is no longer coming in. And so how did Puerto Rico pay its bills? Here's John Oliver. And to pay its bills, the government started issuing tons of municipal bonds. And a municipal bond is basically an IOU. Puerto Rico borrows money from someone, uh, promising to pay it back later with interest. And for years, people lined up to buy those bonds because... Thanks to some other quirks in the law, they were very attractive. Congress decided bonds from Puerto Rico would be triple tax exempt. Those who buy them don't have to pay federal, state or local taxes on the bonds. Triple tax exempt, which means that like if you bought these IOUs from Puerto Rico, you don't have to pay any taxes on them at all. And the New York Times said that Puerto Rico's bonds were particularly attractive to mutual funds. And the thing is, A lot of us have mutual funds. Us regular people, we have mutual funds for whatever reasons. In fact, I have a mutual fund and I don't invest in anything. And one of the things that you might want to do is to check and see if you have Puerto Rican bonds inside of your mutual fund. Well, that might be a little difficult. Here's why. Here's John Oliver. Now, now, Wall Street loved those tax breaks, as well as the fact that thanks to yet another legal quirk that they themselves lobbied for, they could stash tons of bonds in funds without putting Puerto Rico in the name. You might even own Puerto Rican bonds and not even know it. You know, one thing that I've noticed while doing Congressional Dish is that labels are so important to the people in Congress. They are so aware of what labels can and cannot do. You know, like we have the Federal Reserve. This was over 100 years ago they created the Federal Reserve, which is not a government agency, but they named it federal. And so almost all of us think that it is. And this is kind of the same idea, but the exact opposite, where if you own a mutual fund and you look inside of it and you don't see Puerto Rico, well, then you think there are no Puerto Rican bonds in there. You know, these labels were really important. And that was a dumb decision by Congress, which, as John Oliver said, this was lobbied for by these Wall Street funds. That one you can definitely blame on Congress. This next one, this was a stupid decision by Puerto Rico, by the local government. This one can't be blamed on Congress, but it definitely made the situation worse. Here's John Oliver. 
Puerto Rico even went a step further to entice Wall Street, writing into its constitution language suggesting that certain bondholders would be paid first ahead of anything else, including funding basic government services. Which is pretty f***ed up. The US owes $1.2 trillion to China, but if you called 911, you would not expect them to say, oh, I'm sorry, we chose to send our fire truck money to Beijing. Have you tried blowing on the fire really hard? And that particular decision made by the government of Puerto Rico is so key in understanding what's going on, especially in this bill, that I do feel like I need to repeat it, which is that it wrote into its constitution that the bondholders, that the banks would be paid first ahead of anything else in the government. And so, you know, that comes before public safety, that comes before the hospitals, that comes before the schools, that, you know, paying the interest to the banks is priority number one. That is so key to keep in mind. But at this point, you know, Puerto Rico's just screwed, <laughs> you know, thanks to the decisions made by the U.S. federal government and the Puerto Rican government. And so the question now becomes, what can they do about it? And it turns out that Puerto Rico in particular is extremely limited in their options. And here's the reason. So this is another clip from the John Oliver um, last week tonight episode from April 17th. And first, you're going to hear John Oliver and then three current members of Congress. First will be Representative Al Green of Texas, followed by Senator Bob Menendez of New Jersey, followed by Senator Dick Durbin of Illinois. And there was one more quirk here which made Puerto Rico a time bomb. Because unlike states, Puerto Rico cannot authorize what's called Chapter 9 bankruptcy, which is huge. Because think about that. If you are massively in debt and you can't declare bankruptcy, you are stuck. And this happened because of a tiny amendment to a law in 1984. And the crazy thing is, no one can say why it was written. It's interesting to note that Chapter 9 applied to Puerto Rico from 1933 to 1984. And then mysteriously, for some reason, Puerto Rico was exempt from Chapter 9. A provision was stuck into a larger bill with no explanation or debate. There is no legislative history to explain why Puerto Rico was singled out. Um, you realize what that is, right? You realize that a provision that's stuck into a larger bill with no explanation or debate, that's a dingleberry. Right now, this Puerto Rico situation, this is a revenge of the Dingleberry situation. Because, you know, in 1984, there was no internet, there was no open secrets, there was no congressional dish. If you wanted to know what was going into a bill, if you wanted to get your hands on a copy of a congressional bill, if you wanted to do what I do all the time, you couldn't do it from your desk in your living room. You had to get your ass to Washington, D.C. And so in 1984, when this type of stuff got snuck in, people didn't know about it. And this particular dingleberry, this was hidden in the definitions section of a bill. And the definitions section, I mean, if you're going to skip anything, the definitions, it's like the glossary. That's the one you skip. And that's where they stuck it. Very, very tricky. Whoever did this. And so it's this dingleberry that no one can defend. No one understands where it came from. It's this dingleberry that's preventing the cities and towns of Puerto Rico from having any ability to force renegotiations with the banks that, you know, have Puerto Rico by the cojones. And so now, because Puerto Rico's towns and cities can't declare bankruptcy and they have to pay back the banks before they're allowed to do government services, in order to have government services continue in Puerto Rico, they need to work out some kind of deal, you know, mano a mano with the bankers. But here's the problem. Here's John Oliver. This is clearly a moment where Puerto Rico could rightly cry out to its creditors for mercy. However, a lot of its creditors are now hedge funds who traditionally thrive on this kind of chaos. Hedge funds often invest in debt-ridden economies, buying up bonds at low prices and looking to flip them for quick profits. And Puerto Rico is their latest target. The strategy has earned them a reputation among critics as so-called vulture funds. It's true, as much as 30% of Puerto Rican debt is now held by vulture funds. And if you are alone in the desert and see vultures perched above you, your first thought is never, oh, thank God, the vultures are coming to help. <laughs> and these vulture funds have lived up to their name, with a group of them producing a report last year titled, For Puerto Rico, There's a Better Way, suggesting budget cuts like cutting excess Medic Medicaid benefits and reducing the number of teachers on the island. So shaving money out of medicine and education is your better way. Well, at least have the intellectual honesty to then change the title of your report to, hey, Puerto Rico, f 
fuck you, pay me. And so these hedge funds are not negotiating. In fact, according to the New York Times, they're demanding 20% interest rates. They want 20% more than they paid in return for their, their IOUs. You know, they can they can survive. The hedge funds, which are only open to the richest of the rich, by the way, you can't just go and like invest in a hedge fund. You have to be loaded to even be eligible. So these people who are already the richest people on the planet, they can afford to take a little bit less than 20%, but they don't want to. And I found that report that John Oliver was talking about, and of course I read it, and they have some more suggestions for Puerto Rico other than, you know, taking less money. They suggest that Puerto Rico change their labor laws related to overtime vacation and bonuses. And I'm guessing that the workers of Puerto Rico would get less of all three. The hedge funds also think that Puerto Rico should privatize their airport, their ports, and one of their main bridges, you know, sell off their infrastructure to pay back the hedge funds, to pay back the richest people in the world. And then, as John Oliver also said, the report recommends cutting Medicaid funds. And from the hearings that I watched, the lack of Medicaid funds is almost unanimously cited as one of the biggest reasons for the crisis in the first place. Because healthcare funding for the territories has an annual limit, regardless of the need of the citizens. And the territories get much less in funding than the states do per person. And since half of their manufacturing jobs have disappeared since 2006, when those tax breaks were taken away by Congress, more people have needed Medicaid. Because Medicaid is health care for poor people. And when less people have jobs and have no income, there's more poor people and they need Medicaid. And this has put an impossible strain on the capped system. Similarly, with Medicare, which is health care for old people, the people in Puerto Rico pay the same Medicare payroll taxes that the rest of us do, but simply get less, which is straight up unfair and also contributing to the health care crisis and the debt that Puerto Rico is incurring because they're having to pay so much more for the citizens' health care than the states do. Now, one problem is that Medicaid is way easier to get in Puerto Rico and citizens of Puerto Rico, I should tell you this, don't pay federal taxes. So, you know, when it comes to fairness issues, we have some shit to work out. But the point is that Puerto Rico needs more money to provide basic health care services, life or death services to its citizens. And the hedge funds think that that is less of a priority than their 20 percent in interest. And so the hedge funds, they refuse to negotiate. And the thing is, the hedge funds don't have to negotiate because they have lobbied and they got our Congress and the Puerto Rican government to write the laws in their favor. So really, the hedge funds can do whatever the hell they want to. What needs to be done is that Congress needs to act. And so Representative Pedro Pierluisi, Pierluisi, I think I screwed that up earlier, but Pedro Pierluisi is the non-voting representative of Puerto Rico in Congress. And like I said before, he went to that weird hearing where he was allowed to speak and then, you know, no questions could be asked of him. But this is what he said about the medical care situation. And this is what he's asking of Congress. For both moral and practical reasons, Congress should swiftly enact a legislative package that gives Puerto Rico more equitable treatment under federal programs. Of course, these provisions will cost money, just as it costs the federal government money every year when it spends $2.5 billion to support the Medicaid program in Iowa, or sends over $400 million in checks to working families in Utah, or provides $100 million to vulnerable individuals in Vermont under the SSI program. If Congress refuses to provide fair treatment to my constituents, they will continue to move in massive numbers to the states in order to obtain it. That is the logical consequence of an illogical system. And that makes sense to me because if I couldn't get health care in the place that I was living, I would move to wherever I had to because, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, number one, is basically just being alive and you need health care to stay alive. So, you know, that's one situation and that is what, you know, the people of Puerto Rico definitely need from Congress. This is one thing Congress can do is they could give Puerto Rico as much money for Medicare and Medicaid as the states get. That is in Congress's power. And then there's one other weirdness that I need to tell you about, because this is also something that Puerto Rico is asking us to address. And that's something called the Jones Act. So in 1917, the same time that we gave the residents of Puerto Rico American citizenship, there was also a law, the Jones Act, that requires everyone in Puerto Rico to buy goods that are delivered on American-made ships and that those ships need to have an American crew or they pay expensive taxes, which is 
so odd in this era of free trade. I mean, right now, pick up whatever is in front of you. And I guarantee you that that piece of crap is made in China or India or South Korea or somewhere that's not America. And yet the people of Puerto Rico, they need to have their stuff come from American ships. Like, since when does it matter that something is American? I mean, isn't this WTO illegal? Just the weirdest thing in the world. And so what happens is the people of Puerto Rico, they need to just make sure that even if they want something from China, it can't come directly from China. It has to come to America, be put on an American-staffed American ship, and then bring it to the island, which just raises costs for no good reason whatsoever. And so in that hearing that I told you about, Governor Padilla of Puerto Rico was very specific. This is what Puerto Rico is asking of Congress. We have never asked Congress for a bailout, and we are not seeking one today. We ask for access to a legal framework to restructure our liabilities, fair treatment in Medicaid and Medicare funding, reform that stimulate labor force participation and tax measures that attract investment to Puerto Rico and create jobs. An exemption for Jones Act, just like the one of our closest neighbors, the United States Virgin Islands. Okay, so that's what Puerto Rico wants. Now, finally, the bill that's in Congress. Now, like I said, this has already passed the House of Representatives and it's something's going to happen to it in the Senate. And that's going to happen very soon. The next debt payment from Puerto Rico is due on July 1st. And so I know the goal is to have this signed into law before the 4th of July holiday. So you'll just have to pay attention to news to see to see what that happens. But this right now is the most likely thing to become law. I think the most important, well, not the most important, but one of the important things to know is one of the things that wasn't in it. Like I just told you, one of the biggest problems in Puerto Rico is that they are not paid the same as the states when it comes to Medicare and Medicaid funding, and this bill does nothing about it. Puerto Rico will not get one more dime from Medicare or Medicaid. It's not even addressed in the bill. Thankfully, though, one of the other things that was brought up over and over again as one of the biggest problems is Puerto Rico's lack of access to the bankruptcy laws. And so this bill would allow Puerto Rico to have some ability to declare bankruptcy under Chapter 11. Now, here's the issue. I can't tell you exactly how they'll be able to declare bankruptcy because they don't have access to the entire chapter. Instead, Congress picked out about 75 sections of bankruptcy law to apply to Puerto Rico, but again, not all of them. And so the Washington Post described these new legal protections for Puerto Rico as, quote, an orderly debt restructuring process akin to bankruptcy, unquote. And, you know, I would love to be able to tell you how exactly this works, but I just simply didn't have time to become an expert in bankruptcy law. So (laughs) we're just going to have to hope at this point that it's something that actually does Puerto Rico some good. I, I simply don't understand the details, but they did get some kind of access to bankruptcy. They will be able to sit down at the table with the banks and work out some kind of deal. I just don't understand the details of those negotiations. And this was something that one congressman in particular was really against. I watched a hearing that took place in the House Financial Services Committee, and it was about, you know, the effect of this Puerto Rico situation on the banks, the poor banks. One congressman in particular, Mick Mulvaney of South Carolina, was just the bank's biggest defender, cheerleader. I mean, he couldn't have been more blatantly for the banks if he tried. And this is what he said about bankruptcy as he was arguing against it, because he voted against this bill, as did half of the Republican Party. My folks have lent money under the understanding that they'd be repaid in a certain fashion and that bankruptcy could not be used as it is used in other states or as it used in corporations, that it was different. And in exchange for that set of facts, they were willing to accept a lower rate of interest. And anyone who talked about the bankruptcy thing, like not being fair, like the reason that we shouldn't give 
Puerto Rico bankruptcy protection and why Mick Mulvaney voted against this bill is because the banks were counting on Puerto Rico being handcuffed and therefore out of fairness to the banks who are demanding or the hedge funds, I should say, out of fairness to hedge funds who are demanding 20 percent interest. We have to leave the, the citizens of Puerto Rico screwed. It's the only fair thing to do. Really? Do hedge funds profits matter more than human beings to Mick Mulvaney? I think they do. And so, like I said, this had support of half the Republicans. So some of the business friendly Republicans don't like the fact that Puerto Rico would have any access to bankruptcy protections. But like I said, they're not getting all access to bankruptcy protections. This would be a unique deal just for the territories. And I can't tell you if it's fair or not. So this is I'm just kind of putting up the the balloon here, just saying like, hey, journalists, like there is a need here for someone who understands bankruptcy law to look into this and find out if Puerto Rico is getting a raw deal with the bankruptcy provisions, because I just simply don't understand them. And then there is one more thing in this section that I think is good for Puerto Rico, which is that there's going to be a lawsuit freeze. So right now, these hedge funds and, you know, all kinds of funds, like the people that got the the bonds, the IOUs from Puerto Rico, they're suing Puerto Rico because, you know, they're supposed to get paid first before sick people and children and, (laughs) you know, so there's all these lawsuits and this bill would put a lawsuit freeze until February 15th, 2017, or six months after this oversight board is created. And this oversight board is the main part of the bill. And I'll get into the details of that in a second. But the main point is that for a little while, Puerto Rico will get some breathing room to get their shit together without any lawsuits and try and work out a deal that they can actually like deal with debt wise long term. Now, the lawsuit freeze is good for the government of Puerto Rico, but the news is not as good in this bill for the workers of Puerto Rico because there is a minimum wage decrease in here for a certain sector of workers. So young people under the age of 25 who get hired, so they're new employees at a company, they could be paid $4.25 an hour for the next four years. Um... I can't even fathom trying to get by in a place where everything's getting more and more expensive on $4.25 an hour. So I think that provision is total crap. And there are a lot of people in the Senate that think so, too. So if there's going to be a fight over this bill, this is the main thing that the fight would be over based on the things that I've been reading online. But now that brings me to the oversight board that I've mentioned a few times here, because that is the main part of this bill. The main purpose of this bill that's passed the House of Representatives is to create an oversight board that's going to have some pretty intense power over Puerto Rico. And something that's really important here is even though Puerto Rico is the territory that's in trouble right now, this oversight board thing also applies to the other territories. So Guam, American Samoa, the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands and the U.S. Virgin Islands, they're probably not paying attention to this at all. But if anything happened in their countries, an oversight board, just like the Puerto Rico one, could pop up and basically control their countries. And this is why I said that. Here's what the oversight board would be. Essentially, this oversight board is going to be a group of seven people who are going to determine the laws, at least the financial laws of Puerto Rico for the foreseeable future. And the way this works is that, you know, this oversight board is going to be created and the territory, in this case, Puerto Rico, needs to balance its budget for four consecutive years. So that's the best case scenario is that they do it right away. And so for four years, the oversight board has control over Puerto Rico and then it dissolves. But the thing is, it's the oversight board itself that determines when that time is. So, you know, it's really up to them how long they rule Puerto Rico. And the oversight board's main job is to do Three things or four things, really. One is to approve of fiscal plans. And so these fiscal plans are going to be submitted by the governor of Puerto Rico and the oversight board needs to certify them. If the government of Puerto Rico doesn't come up with a fiscal plan that gets certified by the oversight board, the oversight board will create a fiscal plan and that will be deemed approved by the governor. So the governor will really have no say. Then the other job of the oversight board is to approve of the budget. So first comes the fiscal plan. And then after the plan, they do the budget, which actually, you know, breaks down the actual numbers. And it's the same type of deal. If the governor and the legislature of Puerto Rico don't have a budget certified by the board by the first day of the fiscal year, then the oversight board will make a budget and that will be deemed approved. Once again, the governor and the legislature have no veto power over what the oversight board says. 
The Oversight Board is also going to have the ability to rescind any law enacted after May 4th, 2016. And I don't know why they picked that date. And the only protection for the laws of Puerto Rico in here is that the laws can't be rescinded if they were designed to comply with a court order, if they implement a federal government program, if they implement laws that match the Oversight Board priorities, or if the laws were meant to maintain a federally funded mass transportation asset. And then last, the Oversight Board will have the ability to approve or disapprove of infrastructure projects. As for how the board will conduct its business, first of all, the oversight board is going to have subpoena power punishable by whatever territorial laws, you know, breaking a subpoena would would have. And then also the oversight board is allowed to conduct their business behind closed doors. None of this has to be open to the public. As for who writes the rules for the oversight board, well, of course, of course, the oversight board itself will write the laws governing its own activities. And then the work of the oversight board, the actual, you know, researching and day-to-day stuff, that can all be privatized. So it can all be done by some lucky companies that get contracts and do it for a profit. As for, you know, let's say you're a Puerto Rican citizen and you don't like what the board is doing to your community. I don't really know what a Puerto Rican could possibly do about it because lawsuits against the board are not allowed. And as far as oversight of the board is concerned, it's quite clear in this bill. It says the territories are prohibited from exercising, quote, any control, supervision, oversight or review over the oversight board or its activities, unquote. They're straight up prohibited from controlling this oversight board at all. I mean, this oversight board will be their overlords. I don't think that that's an exaggeration. I would also be very concerned if I was a worker in Puerto Rico because the oversight board has been told in this bill that it must, quote, ensure prompt enforcement, unquote, of any territorial laws that, quote, prohibit public sector employees from participating in a strike or lockout, unquote. And one of the reasons that these employees might want to go on strike is that the oversight board will be allowed to make recommendations to change how pensions are paid to government employees. And we already know that pension cuts. I mean, we saw that in the government funding bill, I think, a year and a half ago. We changed the pension laws so that benefits to, you know, regular U.S. citizens that live in the states and have full rights, those pensions are now allowed to be cut. That door is now open. And so that's just the way the momentum is going. So when I hear change the pensions, it's probably not in a good way. (laughs) You know what I mean? And pensions, you know, I wonder if that's something that people, especially in my generation, really have our heads wrapped around because pensions are a way of having a retirement funded where the money is set aside during the working years and then paid after retirement. So instead of getting like, let's say I'm just picking a number, but let's say instead of getting $20 an hour, you get $14 an hour and that six gets set aside and then you get it in your retirement years. You know, it's basically it's referred to often as deferred payment for work performed and for workers. They earned that money and they should get every penny that they earned, you know, But a big problem that we're having in this country, including in Puerto Rico, is that the companies who were trusted to set aside the pension payments for their employees and pay them out during retirement, well, they gambled with that money on the stock market in order to make it grow. And so that's when you hear about pension funds. That's what that is. They took the giant pot of money of all the employees' pensions. They gambled with it on the stock market. And you know what happens when you gamble? Sometimes you lose. And pension funds can and do lose money, leaving them short when it comes time to pay. Because like John Oliver told us earlier, funds, be they mutual, hedge, pensions, whatever, they ate up Puerto Rico's IOUs because they were triple tax exempt. And because the names could be hidden, many of the gamblers, the bankers in charge of these funds, weren't aware that there was Puerto Rican IOUs in there. And because our retirements, whether it's through pension funds or mutual funds or 401ks, because our retirements, too, are now stock market based, you know, we now are being told that we have selfish motivations for siding with the gambling banks because each of us now has skin in the game. And so that's how this whole thing works. They get regular people like me and you to do the bidding of the banks by convincing us that our retirements are going to get hurt by, you know, changing the laws in a way that would benefit the citizens of Puerto Rico instead of the hedge funds. You know, this is how they get us to side with the banks. They get as much of our wealth tied up in the stock market as possible so that we have the same motivations as the banks. It's all based on greed. 
And a beautiful lesson in how this works was done by that guy, Mick Mulvaney, that South Carolina guy who was shamelessly defending the banks in the hearing that I watched. In this clip here, like, mind you, there were five people. I'm not exaggerating. There were five congressmen that attended this hearing, which was not aired on C-SPAN. And I love watching these types of hearings because they speak much more freely. And in this clip I'm about to play you, you're going to get a lesson in spin. You're going to hear how Mick Mulvaney is spinning this to make people like you and I side with the banks. Thanks. The understanding of the lenders, which you talked about at some length, is, is critical here and central to the issue. And you use the word banks, I use the word retirees, but when the retirees in my district invested in these bonds, they did so under a certain understanding. So take note of what he's doing here. He's substituting the concept of retirees for banks because people like you and I, we have mutual funds or 401ks or money set aside for us in pension funds. We are the retirees, in theory, who would get hurt if the funds are forced to take any less than the 20% interest that they believe they were promised. We're supposed to care more about the pennies and lost interest in our 401ks than we are supposed to care about our American citizens who are literally unable to keep the lights on in their hospitals in Puerto Rico. We're supposed to side with the hedge funds by substituting the word banks for retirees. They're making us think that we are just as much hurt as the hedge funds are by allowing Puerto Rico to have bankruptcy protection because of the effects on our own retirements, which, by the way, according to Mark Zandi, the chief economist at Moody's Analytics, these effects on our retirements are being totally overblown. Pensioners, and we're talking about at least the data I've seen, 330,000 current and future uh, pensioners, they are residents of the island for the most part. And so, you know, if they don't get their pension payment, then that's just going to exacerbate, severely exacerbate the economic effect on the island. The creditors, the folks that own the bonds, they're distributed around the world. And you're right, they're, they're me, they're you in our, the funds that we own. So you're, you're absolute, but the pain of that would be distributed much more widely across the globe. So by choosing to allow cuts to the pensioners in Puerto Rico, you're going to hurt some people very badly. You're going to hurt older people that don't have another source of income in a place where the government services don't really exist. You're going to create desperate people as opposed to someone like me and you and all of us collectively who might lose pennies or so in our 401ks. It's distributed amongst us. We're probably not going to notice. And there was a plan when this bill was being crafted that would have still guaranteed hedge funds every penny of their blood money, but only after essential services and pensions were paid for, which is an arrangement just like what we have here in the actual states. But there was Mick Mulvaney crying foul on behalf of the banks. And now that you're aware of his language tricks, listen to this sad song for the banks and the hedge funds. I understand that the Treasury's plan would change the prioritization of payments in Puerto Rico to prioritize payments to Puerto Rican pensioners before bondholders get paid. So the Treasury plan would pay pensioners in Puerto Rico before we pay the pensioners who lent Puerto Rico money in the first place. And I want to know how that is fair. Fair? You want to talk about fair? Do you think 20% interest is fair? That's loan sharking. That's mob... The hedge funds and the billionaires who make money from hedge funds have more money than they could ever know what to do with. Fair would be acknowledging that reality and forgiving a huge chunk of the debt payment that they don't need for survival, unlike the people in Puerto Rico who are in hospitals with no electricity. At the very least, these hedge funds could lower the interest to something reasonable, something in the low single digits, perhaps, like you and I expect from our investments lately. But no, did this bill prioritize the payments to pensioners, to hospitals, to basic social services over the banks? No. The idea of allowing the workers to get their pensions, to get their own money that they worked for before the hedge funds get their 20 percent. Well, that was not included in this bill. The actions of this bill sided with Mick Mulvaney. It sided with the hedge funds, allowing cuts and privatization of Puerto Rico pensions to ensure that the banks who Mulvaney calls retirees to ensure that those banks get paid.
And I think I got a little ahead of myself there, but you should know that on top of allowing cuts to pensions, the board will also have the authority to cut budgets for services, institute hiring freezes, so no more jobs, 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 and they're allowed to cut off agencies from making any financial transactions at all. This board is going to control the finances of Puerto Rico, and it's going to do so in a way that I think is going to hurt the citizens of Puerto Rico. Now, like I said before, this oversight board is going to have seven people on it. And so these people who get to make their own rules and get to determine all the financial laws, you know, which laws stay, which laws go. These people are going to be extremely powerful in Puerto Rico. And so how they are selected is extremely important, too. Well, brother. The seven people that are going to be on the oversight board, first of all, they're going to be appointed for three years at a time and consecutive terms are allowed. So there's no limit to how long these people will be on there. And all seven members are theoretically appointed by the president, but not really, because six out of the seven members are going to be selected from lists created by the leaders in Congress. Now, this all needs to be done by September 15th of 2016. And so we know exactly who's going to get to make these lists and what their names are. And so Paul Ryan is going to get to make two of the lists. Mitch McConnell makes two of the lists. Nancy Pelosi makes one. Harry Reid makes one. And Barack Obama makes one. And if you're keeping track on like a a Republican versus Democrat scale, that's four Republicans, three Democrats. So the Republicans are going to choose the majority of this board. This bodes very well for anyone involved in big business. Now, it says in the bill that the people who are selected that are put on these lists, they must have, quote, knowledge and expertise in finance, municipal bond markets, management, law, or the organization or operation of business or government, unquote. So that definitely qualifies any kind of bankers. You could actually have a board full of bankers making these decisions for Puerto Rico about what gets cut so that the bankers can get paid. And then also the bill says that no one who has worked for the territory's government is allowed on the oversight board. So Puerto Rico is not allowed to be represented on the board. And actually, I need to dial that back a sec because it's not necessarily that people from Puerto Rico are not allowed on the board. Technically, they're not allowed on the board. More accurately, they're not guaranteed a seat on the board. There is a provision in here that says that one of Paul Ryan's two picks has to either be a territory resident, so that would be someone who lives in Puerto Rico, or, quote, have a primary place of business in the territory, unquote, which allows one of these hedge fund guys who moved to Puerto Rico in order to dodge paying federal taxes, that person would be eligible. So, I mean, it doesn't have to be someone who's been involved in the Puerto Rican government. In fact, those people are not allowed. And there's definitely a way that the one pick that has to be a a Puerto Rican resident can be someone who's a member of the big business community. And then the governor of Puerto Rico, he will have a kind of a role in this board in that the governor or his designee will be allowed to be an ex officio member with no voting rights whatsoever. So they can basically sit there and look pretty. And, you know, what's really interesting about that term ex officio being in this bill. It's that that term ex officio dates back to the Romans, which feels so right in this case, because This board is just, it's so undemocratic and so colonial and just so imperialist that I just think that giving the governor an ex officio, a Roman termed role with no voting rights whatsoever, it just brings that icky Roman empire feeling, doesn't it? But anyway, the core seven people on the oversight board, these are unpaid positions. However, this board is still going to make it rain for other people. And keep in mind that if this board is, as I suspect, going to be staffed with members of big business, they're going to be able to craft laws that make their businesses and make their own stocks and make their own paychecks get bigger. So it's not exactly unpaid if this turns out the way I'm suspecting it's going to. But as for getting money for the actual job of sitting on the board, they don't. Their staff, however, will. They will get a paid staff. 
There will be an executive director of the board, and it's not very clear to me what the hell the executive director is going to do, but the board's going to determine this person's salary, and the executive director can hire as many staff members as he wants and decide how much each of these people get paid. There's also going to be a position called the revitalization coordinator, and I'm going to go off about this in a second. But the revitalization coordinator is the person who's going to pick infrastructure projects for Puerto Rico, which is so economic hitman, I can hardly handle it. If you have not read the book, first of all, you need to read the book. It's called Confessions of an Economic Hitman by John Perkins. John Perkins was the economic hitman. And if you read that book, what you find out is that for decades, the multinational corporations and aided by our government have been going to countries that are in debt and doing these giant infrastructure projects, you know, supposedly for the people. But the giant infrastructure projects are always enriching the companies that are hired to do them. So these contracts go out to multinational companies to build these big projects. And the people that pay for the big projects are the countries where the infrastructure projects are done. And what happens is they take out loans to build these big projects, loans that are so big that they can never actually pay them back. And just like you're seeing here in Puerto Rico, the whole pattern is that the banks or the hedge funds or whoever, basically the economic hitman, they go in there and they say, well, you need to pay us back. And if you can't, you need to do reforms, reforms that privatize everything. So just like that report said, the hedge funds in Puerto Rico's, they've got their eye on the airports. They've got their eyes on the ports. They want the bridges and they definitely want the electricity grid. And so that is what's happening here. So the same economic prescription is now being set up in this bill. There's going to be a whole position for coordinating these infrastructure projects. Seriously, read that book, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, and this is going to make so much sense to you. But yeah, on this oversight board, we're going to have paid positions. And another thing that's super creepy about this is that the hiring process and the contracting process for these people is going to be exempt from like every law. That's not an exaggeration. Here's an exact quote from the bill. Quote, the executive director and staff of the oversight board may be appointed and paid without regard to any provision of the laws of the covered territory or the federal government governing appointments and salaries. Any provision of the laws of the covered territory governing procurement shall not apply to the oversight board, unquote. So not only are the staffing laws, but also procurement laws, the buying stuff laws, the contracting laws, they're all going to be waived when it applies to the oversight board. That is trouble. And where is all this money coming from? Well, when it comes to funding, the oversight board is going to be funded by the permanent budget of the territory. It's going to be funded by Puerto Rico. So not only did we not give them a dime in this bill for Medicare or Medicaid, they're certainly not going to get paid the way that the states are. We've done nothing to make that more fair. We didn't give them a dime for the stuff that they actually need. Not only that, but we're going to make Puerto Rico pay for this oversight board. So Puerto Rico comes to us in Congress and says, hey, United States of America, we're screwed. Please help us. And what do we do? We give them overlords and make them pay for it. You guys, we're dicks. And the bill for this oversight board is going to be high because until the territory creates a law providing permanent funding, the territory is going to be forced to transfer whatever the oversight board requests in its budget, which is going to be at least $2 million per month to a fund controlled by the Oversight Board. $2 million per month. That is $24 million a year for the Oversight Board. Why? Why do they need $24 million to tell Puerto Rico what to do? And the only thing in here, like if that's too much money for this job, which um, it is, the Oversight Board will be allowed to give some of the money back. They won't be required to. This is crazy. And then really quick before I wrap this up, because we're almost done here. Like I said, the vast majority of this bill is about creating this oversight board. There really wasn't much done for Puerto Rico. I mean, it was the the minimum wage cut, the bankruptcy sort of provisions and the oversight board. That's really that's really all this bill was. 
But like I said, part of the oversight board is going to be a paid position of a revitalization coordinator. And this is the one who's going to identify and approve of, quote, critical, unquote, infrastructure projects. And so the revitalization coordinator is the person who picks what's critical and what isn't. And if something is deemed to be a critical infrastructure project, there's going to be an expedited, a sped up permitting process for those projects. Now, these expedited permitting processes are going to be operated as if the governor of Puerto Rico had declared an emergency under Puerto Rican law. So we're now using emergency powers, which, as we know, over the course of Congressional Dish, so many things that wouldn't be allowed otherwise are allowed during an emergency. So basically, when it comes to infrastructure, Puerto Rico is going to be governed by emergency law. And when it comes to the assessment of these critical projects... One of the qualifications for if a project is going to be a critical project is how the project helps with, quote, transitioning to privatized generation capacities in Puerto Rico, unquote. So that's talking about the energy grid, about, you know, generating energy, and they're going to privatize the energy, the utilities in Puerto Rico. I mean, this is very clear from this bill. And you know what? I wasn't all that surprised to see it in the bill because I had watched the hearing before I read this and Mick Mulvaney, that guy that was doing the big business bidding in that hearing, well, he said this. I also understand in doing some research that some of the debt revolves around the government-owned electric company, which has not raised its rates on its people since 1989. So again, I ask, is it fair for us to ask pensioners and retirees, some of whom may live in South Carolina, to incur greater debts on their own debt in the future or to lose prioritization here so that the Puerto Rican government can continue to provide below market subsidized electricity to their residents. That doesn't strike me as fair. Fairness. So much of this seems unfair to the people of Puerto Rico. I mean, they're an American citizen as just as much as I am, and yet they don't have nearly as many rights. And then their island has just been pillaged by these companies. I mean, in 1976, a Congress that these people have absolutely no say in, they get no vote. They don't get to vote for president, and they don't have representation in Congress. Their congressman doesn't have a vote. So this Congress that they have no control over whatsoever This Congress decided to give a tax break to the island and then yank it away 20 years later. It causes a major crisis. And now this crisis is being used to privatize their infrastructure, to give it away to the private sector, to give it to the for-profit utilities. And right now, the people of Puerto Rico, one of the few things they seem to have, because they're paying more in so many different levels. They're paying more in property tax and value-added tax and sales tax. And they're paying more for water and for tolls and their public transportation has been cut. And there's so many cuts and they're getting so much less for the investment in their own government. But it seems like if they're getting below market subsidized electricity, it's one of the few perks they still have. And this bill is going to take it away. It's using a crisis that was created by Congress to do a favor for these utility companies that would totally want to go in there and profit over a service that everybody needs, you know? And that's why utilities are such a guarantee, because every one of us needs electricity. And the private sector wants their hands on it. They're taking advantage of a crisis. It just doesn't seem fair. It also doesn't seem fair that the oversight board can waive any law they want to that would adversely impact the expedited permitting process for these critical infrastructure projects. You know, it's just not fair. It doesn't seem fair that the people of Puerto Rico, because they have no say in who is on the oversight board or any kind of control whatsoever, oversight, anything of the oversight board, It doesn't seem fair that this board and the revitalization coordinator is going to get to pick where Puerto Rico invests its money in its infrastructure. I mean, what if the citizens of Puerto Rico want a new bridge? What if they want a ferry? But the oversight board wants something completely different that benefits, you know, the banks or the rich people that are moving there. The oversight board gets to pick. The citizens of Puerto Rico have no say whatsoever. And infrastructure projects are very expensive decisions that affect Puerto Ricans' day-to-day lives, how they get from, you know, place to place. It doesn't seem fair that they have no say in that. It also doesn't seem fair that even after the oversight board disappears, if it ever disappears, because again, the oversight board chooses when it exists and when it doesn't, even after the oversight board stops existing, these critical projects chosen by the oversight board 
those are going to have to be processed and completed under the expedited permitting process, even if the oversight board no longer exists. So the people of Puerto Rico, when they do get some control over their financial situation back, they're not going to get to cancel those projects. It's like once the oversight board says that it's going to be, well, then it's going to be regardless of what Puerto Rico thinks. And if you need any proof of that, it also says that the lawsuits against these critical projects must be brought within 30 days of the decision to do the project. 30 days. I mean, in 30 days, most of the people of Puerto Rico won't even know that it's happening. So that's such a short window that this pretty much bars any lawsuits from these these critical projects, especially if they're like under construction and there's environmental damage or whatever. I mean, basically, no lawsuits are allowed. It's a bad situation. If I was a resident of Puerto Rico, I would really hate this bill. You know, this bill, the governor asked for some specific things. You know, they came to Congress and they basically begged. And what they asked for was a legal framework to restructure our liabilities. They kind of got that. They wanted fair treatment in Medicare and Medicaid funding. They didn't get that at all. They wanted reforms to stimulate labor force participation. I'm not really sure lowering the minimum wage to $4.25 was what he was talking about. They wanted tax measures that attract investment in Puerto Rico. So something like the Section 936, that didn't come back. And then they wanted an exemption from the Jones tax, which was that thing that, you know, says that the people of Puerto Rico have to get all of their stuff from American ships that are crewed with Americans. It's just it's so bizarre. And that wasn't even overturned. I mean, something that stupid and so basic wasn't addressed in this bill. So really, the only thing they got was partial bankruptcy protection, everything else they asked for was ignored. And what they definitely didn't ask for was an oversight board that's going to basically make all their financial laws. I didn't hear anyone begging for that. This is the last clip I'm going to play for you today. This was Representative Nadia Velasquez of New York. And this is what she said in that hearing that, like I said, was not on C-SPAN. This was in the House Financial Services Committee. There were like five congressmen there and they were speaking very clearly. This is what Nadia Velasquez said to her colleagues. There is a lot of blame to go around, including this same body, because we lack public policy uniformity when it comes to the U.S. territories. So look at how much reimbursement they get when it comes to Medicare and Medicaid. We subject Puerto Rico to the same standards that we subject hospitals here and any other institution. And yet they don't have the resources to abide or to comply with those standards. When it comes to the Jones Act, when it comes to so many other issues, we give and we take away. We promote economic growth in Puerto Rico by providing Section 936 when we need it to showcase Puerto Rico, as Ms. Krieger said, as the jewel of the Caribbean, sending a message, what, to Cuba, Fidel Castro? This is what it takes to be a good partner. But now that Puerto Rico is not needed to showcase what a good relationship with the United States means no longer is an asterisk. Puerto Rico cannot be a nuance for the United States government. And you know what? We will pay. We will provide the tools or we will pay later. 1.2 million Puerto Ricans basically have left the island and they are living in Florida. So be prepared to provide for bilingual education, health care in your own congressional districts. And she's right. Because the people in Puerto Rico are American citizens. <laughs> you know, this isn't some foreign country this is happening to. The economic hitman, they're coming home. They're eating the United States now. And so when people leave Puerto Rico and they come to the United States, they can live wherever they want. They can work wherever they want. They can get their Medicaid. They can get their Medicare. They can get their votes by leaving Puerto Rico and coming to live near you. Now, I'm personally... I have no problem with that. <laughs> I don't care if my neighbors are Puerto Rican. If anything, I want them to teach me how to cook. But, you know, that is something that we need to keep in mind because we're going to pay one way or the other. And what we're doing right now by basically allowing the hedge funds to bleed Puerto Rico dry is just doesn't seem like a wise decision. And this bill, it's not going to solve that problem. But regardless, this bill passed the House of Representatives on June 9th. It passed 297 to 127. And this was an interesting one. 
party tells you nothing about how the person voted because the Republican Party, they split almost in half. Almost half of the Republicans said yes, almost half said no. And actually, the Democrats were the ones that showed up and really got this thing through. A lot more Democrats supported it than did not. So, you know, the red blue divide, this is another one of those issues where it just doesn't really exist. Like I said before, the Senate's going to vote on this soon. If there is amendments to it, well, then I guess we'll just have to revisit this and find out what happens. But I mean, looking in my crystal ball, I think that this is just going to pass straight up and that it's going to get signed into law. I think this one has a really, really good chance. (laughs) It is what it is. This bill was written by Representative Sean Duffy of Wisconsin. He was the only sponsor. You might remember Sean Duffy as that doofus from the real world Boston. Yeah, he actually ran for Congress, has been there for a long time now, and is making a huge impact on Puerto Rico. And according to his profile on Open Secrets, he's taken over $1.2 million from the financial industry, which I think is the big winner in this bill because it's the financial industry that didn't lose one penny of the money that they expect to get from from Puerto Rico. This bill is a huge favor to them. And in case you're wondering, there were 47 lobbyists deployed to lobby for this bill. So, I mean, heavy hitters wanted this one. Puerto Rico didn't stand a chance. So I have been trying to gracefully record this part of the podcast now for an hour and a half. I've just pressed record over and over and over again. And I I don't know how to do this because I have to tell you something that's really uncomfortable and I'm kind of freaking out because this podcast is listener supported, which means that you get it for free up front. And this is a product, by the way. Congressional Dish is a business. I need to earn a living. I work full time at this and I have hired two people to help me do this. This is a business. And my product is the podcast episodes that you receive every two weeks or twice a month. So I give you the product up front and expect you to pay whatever you think it's worth. And I leave that completely up to you. And the message that I've gotten in the last two weeks is that Congressional Dish is worth next to nothing. Because the support for Congressional Dish has almost completely dried up. And, you know, that's that's not entirely true. I feel guilty saying that because some people have contributed. So really quick, we do have one new subscriber. So thank you for being on the Congressional Dish team, Bruce Howe of Paw Paw, Michigan. He's now contributing $5 a month. And two existing subscribers, which, by the way, thank you to the existing subscribers because I would not be able to pay my bills without you for this last episode. But thank you, Anthony Roberts of Burlingame, California, who increased his subscription from $10 to $20. And thank you, Bruce Coop of Newcastle, California, who increased his subscription from $10 to $15. Thank you very much, guys. And then we also had a few one-time contributions. We got $41.46. That was the largest one. We got $41.46 from Peter Downs, who said, thanks again for a wonderful and informative content. Keep up the good work. You're very welcome, Peter. We also got $20.05 from Kafra Newton. Thank you very much. We got $20 from our good friend Mikhail in Russia. Thank you, Mikhail. And we got 500 pesos from Mark Sprague in Puerto Vallarta. Thank you, Mark. And we also got $5.24 from our good friend Bud Johnson, who, you know, Bud sends in cards and checks, but he's kind of a subscriber because I always see Bud's name. So thank you very much, Bud, for your consistent support for this podcast. But that's it, guys. 86.75 is all the podcast brought in, and that doesn't even pay a third of the audio editing alone for producing this podcast. So I am financially freaking out and I'm trying to figure out why this happened. And you know, my instinct is always to blame myself and to look at the last episode and be like, what did I do wrong? But I don't think that I did anything wrong with that one. I mean, I I honestly think that the transportation law is important and that there was value in that podcast episode. You know, that was a 500-page law, so it is governing you for the next five years. And I understand that it might be annoying to a lot of people in this car-loving country to hear that getting in your car is one of the most dangerous things that you can do every day. People don't like hearing that. So maybe there's some shooting of the messenger going on because I've been 
been told by people in my personal life that it's very annoying when I tell them that, you know, their cars are death mobiles. And yeah, people just don't like hearing that. So maybe that message, I could have toned it down a little bit. I don't know. Was that it? But the thing is, I don't really think that that was it. My gut tells me that the reason that support dried up was because I shared something I was excited about financially. I shared the biggest success to date, which is that the Shuttleworth Foundation, thanks to Tiffany Chang, and thank you again, Tiffany, Tiffany nominated Congressional Dish without my knowing for a flash grant of $5,000 because the work here, the Shuttleworth Foundation found valuable and they gave it to me. And I was so excited about that for a hot second. I was financially excited because I feel like this podcast needs to grow. And a good way to do that is to hire an agent, which by the way, I've put on hold because I'm freaking out. And so, you know, that's what I wanted to use that money for. But at this time, I'm just kind of leaving it in the bank account because I have to pay for some trips in July that are kind of essential. I'm going to podcast movement where I'm speaking and I'm going to Netroots Nation to find out, you know, what goes on at a political convention. And I have to pay those bills. I have to pay for airfare and hotels. And, you know, there's a lot I have to pay for. So right now, the Shuttleworth grant is sitting in my account. I have it set aside. I'm still hoping to get an agent. But I can't if the podcast is bringing in eighty six seventy five on top of subscriptions. I mean, that's just not going to cut it, you know? And so what I'm afraid of is that people who have emailed me over the last, I mean, year or so telling me, Jen, don't tell anyone about the money you have coming in because people will stop donating. You know, I choose to believe that people are good, you know, that people will pay for the value they receive from the podcast regardless of how much money I'm bringing in. And am I being proven wrong? You know, the one time I have something awesome happen and I tell you and support completely dries up. I mean, is the message I'm supposed to receive that I shouldn't tell you when good things happen? Because that doesn't feel good. I don't want to do that. I want to share my successes with you in the same way that I've shared all of these struggles in the last three and a half years. I want to celebrate with you, especially the people who are contributing to the podcast. You know, I want you to hear the good stuff too. But how can I do that if I'm going to be financially punished every time I do? So I don't know. I'm, I'm super nervous about this. And the thing is that I feel like it shouldn't matter how much I'm making either personally or for the podcast because that's not really the point. The point is not how much I get from this. The point is how much you get from this. Is Congressional Dish giving you information that you can't get anywhere else? Is Congressional Dish entertaining you? Is Congressional Dish making your commute more interesting or in any way more fun? You know, if the answer to any of those questions is yes, there's value in that. And so it shouldn't matter how much the podcast has. It should matter what you got. And then you should contribute for that. And I know that some people at some point are like, well, you chose this listener supported model. You can just do advertisements. Well, you know what? Advertisements, you pay for advertisements. You don't pay with your dollars, but you pay with your time. And which means that you're paying for almost every single podcast that you listen to. Because think about it this way. If I had chosen to do advertisements for the 128 Congressional Dish episodes, let's say I chose to do five minutes of ads in each episode, which is pretty standard, if not low, for the people that do take ads for their podcasts. So let's say at five minutes an episode times 128 episodes of Congressional Dish, do you know that that would have been 640 minutes of advertisements? Do you know that that would have been over 10 hours of your life spent listening to ads? You know, what are 10 hours of your life worth to you? What do you make at work for 10 hours of your life that I didn't make you sit down and listen to ads for? I mean, imagine if someone made you sit down in a chair and listen to ads for 10 hours straight. You know, that's CIA torture type shit. And I don't do that. You know, instead, I do the listener supported model. And there are plenty of people that listen to this podcast week after week and don't contribute. You know, I know that the vast majority of the people listen to this every week and just fast forward and just move on. But the thing is that this podcast, I don't make you pay with your time. I ask you to return the value you receive. And doesn't appear to be working right now. So 
I mean, I think this is just where I need to leave it. I need to let you know that I'm freaking out. And if you want to contribute the value that you've received from this podcast from the last two episodes, which I think these last two episodes have been some of the most valuable ones I've ever done. The transportation law, like I said, that is law that is governing us for five years. I think it matters. And for this one, for Puerto Rico... I mean, people in the United States need to know what's going on in Congress when it comes to Puerto Rico, because no one is paying attention to this. And American citizens are getting eaten by economic hitmen. It's happening here, you guys. It happened all over Latin America. And, you know, that was in another place. It was a different America. Well, Puerto Rico, those people are us. And the hedge funds are eating them. I care about that. And I think you should care about that. And I think the biggest struggle that we're having here with this situation in this country is that people don't know that it's happening. And they sure as hell don't know what's in this bill. You know, because right now, I mean... I just Googled it again. I just checked it out. All of these organizations and mainstream media, they're all pushing the Senate to pass this. Whether it's the lobbyists or the free market people, they're all pushing Congress to pass this bill. And you just found out why. You understand why, because this is really good for big business. It's not so good for the Puerto Rican citizens. People, people just like you and me. So I think these last two episodes do have value. And if you agree with me, if you think this podcast has value in general, contribute whatever you think is fair, please. And you can do that by going to the support page on congressionaldish.com. If you'd like to pay with a credit card or with PayPal, you have PayPal options. You can set up a subscription, which allows you to be one of the people that contributes to this podcast on a monthly basis. And like I said, that was so key in the last two weeks. It's the only reason I haven't completely lost my mind. So thank you again to the subscribers. You can also contribute one time, which would be great because there were very few of those this week. And then also paper checks. You can send paper checks to the P.O. Box. You can do it through your online banking. That costs you nothing. And it costs, you know, there's no commission taken when you do that either. So you can sign up, send the checks to the P.O. Box, which is listed on congressionaldish.com. You can write physical checks. You can send gifts. I mean, you can use also, also, you can use the Amazon search box every time you shop by going to congressionaldish.com. In the right-hand corner, you type in whatever you want to buy. And as long as you enter Amazon that way, then Congressional Dish gets a commission. That does add up and it does help the podcast. But what really helps the podcast is money. It's you contributing whatever value you get from this podcast in some kind of financial form. So please, please do that because if contributions stay this low, (laughs) I don't even know. I don't know what I'm going to do. So um, yeah. Now really quick, just because the thank you section was really short and I kind of want to do more of the dishing about Congress because since I changed the format of Congressional Dish, This podcast hasn't really been all that current. This is something that with the 115th Congress, I really need to work on. And what I'm kind of seeing the shift being is that the first half of the episode is going to be as it was today about Puerto Rico or whatever the topic is. I do the thank you section. And then afterwards, I kind of just tell you what went on. Not research heavy, but just like this is what happened this week. This is the funny stuff, the interesting stuff, like whatever. And this week was one of the craziest C-SPAN experiences I've ever ever had, which is that the House of Representatives, the Democrats, this was a definitely a party thing, but the Democrats in the House of Representatives decided to do a protest on the floor of the House. It was bananas. So this all kind of started, I mean, really, it started back with like Columbine when we had one shooting after another, after another, after another, after another, and there has been no gun legislation passed. So it's still really easy to get a gun in the United States and a lot of people are dying. And so on, um, I can't remember, June 6th, June 9th, I can't remember, but a Sunday morning, we all woke up to the news that some crazy homophobe went into the Pulse nightclub in Orlando and killed 50 people with an AR-15 rifle. And that made a lot of people mad. And so for the past few weeks, I mean, if you follow me on social media, it will not be news to you that I despise guns. I really, I cannot stand them. I don't like it when anyone has a gun in my presence. Guns are never welcome in my home. I cannot stand guns. And so I was definitely in the gun control debate online. You know, everybody was. Everyone was getting into this. And so this week, Chris Murphy, who's a senator from Connecticut in the Senate, 
he got up and did a filibuster about gun legislation. And the Democrats tried to get gun legislation passed through the Senate. Now, the legislation in typical Democrat style was garbage legislation because what they tried to do was make it so that if you're on the terrorist watch list, then you can't purchase a gun. Well, these are the same people who acknowledged when the terrorist watch list became a thing that the terrorist watch list is total crap. There's a very arbitrary way of getting on the terrorist watch list. These people have been, and many of the people that are on the list have been convicted of no crimes whatsoever. There's like a million people on it. It's very hard to get off of the terrorist watch list once you're on it. So it's a very imprecise way of picking like who's a suspected criminal or whatever. So the terrorist watch list, these are people who used to be against it, but they just want to do something to pander to the people like me that are like, enough with the guns. So I think it was a pandering move. I think all of this had an element of pandering to it, even though the expressions that were made, the arguments that were made, I think those were legit. I think the emotions were true. But the moves themselves, I mean, trying to fight really hard for this bill that ties gun rights or gun access, I should say, to the terrorist watch list. I mean, you know, this is just a way of doing something that doesn't really piss off their donors. This isn't really going to piss off the NRA. It's something, but it's nothing, you know, too substantial. And so this is what they decided to take a stand on. So Chris Murphy does his filibuster. Nothing happens in the Senate. No legislation is passed. Fast forward to yesterday and John Lewis goes to the floor of the House and him and a bunch of Democratic House members decide to stage a protest. They said, we're not leaving this floor until there's gun legislation. They said, no bill, no break, because the House of Representatives is about to adjourn for their 4th of July holiday. Mind you, I'm recording this on the night of Thursday, June 23rd. And so that's a really long vacation for a holiday that the rest of us get for one day. So let's just acknowledge that. But they were chanting, no bill, no break, no bill, no break. And so that was, you know, the whole thing. So as this went on, it started in the morning and the cameras were supposed to turn on at 12. And this was something that I think educated a lot of people in the United States, which is people found out that C-SPAN doesn't control their own cameras. It's the House of Representatives that controls when those cameras are on or off. And C-SPAN just taps into their feed. And so when Paul Ryan got wind of, Paul Ryan being the Speaker of the House, when he got wind of what was going on in the House floor, he adjourned to the House of Representatives, which had the effect of letting them turn the cameras off and it had them turn off the microphones. So the House floor basically becomes like, pandemonium. It's just total chaos in there. And part of the chaos is that representatives and senators were sneaking their phones onto the House floor so they could film what was going on and put it on Periscope. Now, that's another bit of education that a lot of people got yesterday, which is that it's a rule of the House. It's not like a constitutional rule, obviously, but it's a rule of the House that you're not allowed to have your phones on the floor. And some of these people had to take some extreme measures to get their phone down there, such as Representative Tammy Duckworth. Tammy Duckworth is a she's a veteran and she has a, a prosthetic leg. She snuck her phone in her fake leg onto the House floor so that she could film what was going on for the American people. Totally amazing. And then throughout the day, there were all these shenanigans of like Paul Ryan basically trying to stop everyone from using their phones. He totally failed at that, but he definitely had the cameras off for most of the day. So in the middle of the night, <laughs> it's like one o'clock in the morning, Paul Ryan adjourns for the day, no gun legislation. And then an hour and a half later, 2.30 in the morning, East Coast time, he starts the new day. They take a vote on a military spending bill slash like money for Zika. They take that vote and then he adjourned for the vacation. So and early. They weren't supposed to adjourn that early, obviously. They're never supposed to be doing work at 2.30 in the morning. So let's just acknowledge that. But it was all basically a trick to shut down this House sit-in. You know, it pretty much worked. The House of Representatives members are not going to be there for the next three weeks. They're not going to miss their, their vacations, God forbid. It was one of the most fascinating things I've ever seen. And watching the House of Representatives through Periscope was also really fun. I mean, I didn't do it for very long. I was preparing this episode. So I really only watched from like 10 p.m. my time until like really when all that stuff went down an hour or two later. 
But watching this go down on Periscope, I mean, you got to hear the side conversations of whoever was near the phone, you know, dummy congressmen that would just like sit down in front of the person who was filming. It would be like, hey, get out the way. It was just really fun. You kind of felt like you were in the House of Representatives. It was it was one of my favorite things I've ever seen on C-SPAN. And one of these days when I'm just really bored, I'm going to go back and watch what went on throughout the day just to like hear those side conversations. I'm sure there's so many amazing clips in there, such as when the House of Representatives Democrats changed the words to we shall overcome and sang a gun control song to the we shall overcome melody. That I need to sound clip for Congressional Dish and keep it forever because that happened. So yeah, that was amazing. Like I said, the bill that they were fighting so hard for, I think was a piece of crap. So I mean, I can appreciate the gesture of being like, we believe so much in this that we're going to protest and we're going to, you know, try and force something in the House as the minority. I wish they cared this much about, you know, the bombing of Syria. <laughs> you know, we're at war right now with a country and have been for years. I mean, we launched this in 2014. We've been at war now for two years with a country that Congress didn't declare war on. I would love to see the Democrats in the House do something like this over something like that instead of, you know, a bill that basically legitimizes the terrorist watch list. So I'm, I'm really not vibing on all of this, but I think if it was used for something better, you know, a better piece of legislation. You know, I, I like the tactic. I enjoyed the entertainment that much, I can tell you. So yeah, that is the congressional dish, <laughs> the gossip of the week. All right. So let's see. I am going to, oh, I am going to be traveling so much in the next month, but your next episode will be on the second Sunday of July. Just so you guys know, the schedule here is not every other week. It's every second and fourth Sunday of every month. You get two episodes of Congressional Dish a month. I'm finding that this is a schedule that I can actually, you know, handle while doing these really research intensive episodes. And so over the next few weeks, let's see, I'll tell you everywhere I'm going because if you're listening this long, you know, you don't have much else to do. So <laughs> tomorrow I'm going to go and watch the AVP Pro Beach Volleyball Tournament in San Francisco. I used to be an intern for the AVP and I haven't watched a tournament since I think 2006 was my last one. It's been 10 years and I love beach volleyball. So I'm super excited for that. And then Leah and the boys, as you know, my, my brother-in-law passed away and his wife, Leah, and my adorable little nephews, they're going to be at a friend's house only an hour and a half from here. So we're going to go spend the weekend with them. So that should be a good time. I, I haven't seen them since the memorial. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. Then I get back. I'm here for 48 hours. Then I drive to Orange County where I'm going to hang out with my family for a few days and then go to my friend's wedding. And then we're going to do a big 4th of July party with some of my favorite people who have ever existed in my whole life. So I'm so excited for 4th of July this year. Then the next day, I fly to Chicago, where I'm going to go to Podcast Movement. I'm going to be speaking there. I've submitted my slides and I still have to do some like tweaks and stuff for the presentation, but I'm on my way to being prepared. I'm just really nervous. This is going to be my first time speaking in front of a group like this. I mean, I took a public speaking class in college, but that doesn't really count. I mean, this is my first professional speaking gig and even just thinking about it makes me want to barf. So wish me luck on that one. And then you'll get your next episode that weekend, actually. So I'm going to be doing podcast movement, speaking and producing an episode. So busy, busy few weeks for me. Then I'll get to go and meet my new baby cousin in Aurora, Illinois. Super excited about that. And then I have a couple days off. So I'm going to go to Springfield, Illinois, basically because the hotels are cheaper. So I'm going to go to Springfield. Apparently there's a lot of Abraham Lincoln stuff there. I don't know. I'll probably watch TV and work a lot in Springfield. And then I go to St. Louis where I will go to Netroots Nation. This is going to be my first political conference. And so I'm going to be producing an episode for you while I'm there. And I don't really know what the episode's going to be. I don't I wanted to go to the place where the people who are really trying to change things are. And Netroots Nation, I heard about it years and years and years ago. It's supposed to be a grassroots thing. I want to see how grassroots it actually is. Yeah, I just want to experience this and give you an episode. I'm not really sure what to expect with that, but I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. I definitely feel 
and this has been some of the feedback. This is one of the reasons I want to do this. I feel like there's a lot of exposure of the things that are wrong in this country, and now we need to start working on ideas on how to fix it. So I'm also seeking out those, and this is one of those steps. You know, I want to go to where the people, the activists are, and find out what they're up to and see if there's any good ideas that we can get behind. And, you know, it's one thing to tell you everything that's wrong, but unless we're trying to make it right, what's the point, you know? So that's what I'm going to do at Netroots Nation, and I get home on July 18th. So I'm tired just thinking about all that. <laughs> but yeah, so that's what's going on with Congressional Dish. The next episode is going to be about the IRS, and there are some shenanigans going on in Congress that you need to know about when it comes to the IRS. It's all about protecting secret campaign contributions, and it's going to a whole new ridiculous level. And so that's the next episode really hearing heavy, really clip heavy. You're going to get to know some of your congressmen in that one. That'll be also kind of like a fun episode. We'll probably get to make fun of a few people. And yeah, so you kind of know what's coming for the next month. Again, please support Congressional Dish by going to the support page on congressionaldish.com and help calm some of my financial nerves. I would really appreciate it. And I hope you guys have a wonderful, safe 4th of July. And yeah, contribute to Congressional Dish on Independence Day for your country. <laughs> that would be a good move. All right. I need to stop babbling. I'm hungry. Got to go. I will talk to you later. Goodbye. We don't have a domestic spying program. They're content to fight in black and white despite the many in between. The polar ice caps aren't going away. We don't think we can deny it anymore. You can stick to your story if you think it lies. But we're not keeping quiet anymore. We are so damn tired of being lied. Government jobs consume the profits of the private sector. We don't think we can deny it anymore. These bills represent common sense, bipartisan solutions.